All right. We are here with Brad Davidson, who is just a cool guy I've known for a long time. And we're going to be talking about all kinds of things to help us with optimizing our health. So that, I mean, all of you ladies, you know, you hear me talk about the same crap all the time of how do we energize ourselves? How do we um, get that extra edge so that we are, we have the most, you know, brain capacity and we're functioning at our highest level so we can get more done and feel great at the same time. And that's why I have you here, Brad, to help us with all this. Um, Let me just talk a little bit about Brad because uh, Brad, you're always doing something new, but I met you through the book that you wrote. I interviewed him years ago about a book that he wrote. Um, what was it called? The the tell me the name of it again, uh, Brad. Uh, Stark Naked Twenty One Day Metabolic Reset. Yeah, he got a bunch of us to do this twenty one day cleanse, and I've done it a bunch of times. I've never felt better, and I still use a lot of the things that you that you teach in that book. So it's great. Um, but Brad, he is all about helping women optimize themselves. He works with CEOs and high level business women like all of you. And uh, we're just going to jump into this. So welcome, Brad. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here with you guys. Be yeah. Fun. Yeah. Always so, fun with you. <laughs> uh, we always have fun. Okay. So let me just tell a quick story about Brad. So I went to his op- his old um, gym that he owned, gosh, it was five years ago or so. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's all about health. And this is back when you, he had like these things that you put into your vein for you to have all kinds of liquids, like liquid IVs. I've actually done them now, but that I'd never seen it before. Yeah. And he had all kinds of crazy stuff going on in there. And then I went to his office and in his office, which was private, it had a sign that said booze that way you go over there and he had every single (laughs) alcohol you could think of I'm like so that's how this all works (laughs) I like you Brad okay so he won me over there but Brad I'm gonna let you take this over so tell us more about you tell us more about how you help women and kind of how you operate yeah uh, so I, I label myself as a performance coach. Um, I love to help people enhance their energy, enhance the performance of work, drive better recovery. Uh, I'm all about energy management. Um, I work with a great team. I, I'm, I'm the performance guy. I have a naturopathic doctor who takes care of my people and it's outside of my reign. Uh, he helps get them healthy and then I help take them become a high performer. Uh, so we're really focused around things like nutrition, exercise, uh, supplementation, sleep strategies, how to enhance the brain for performance, a a lot of fun stuff. And and why I like working with the female so much is the female metabolism, especially in the performance world, is very misunderstood. Um, For example, I I caught on early on that for the first kind of 60 years of studying metabolism, all the research was done on college-aged boys, and then it was handed over to women and say, here's the answer to your problems. And I've worked with both groups enough to know the metabolisms are very different. And especially as an, a woman ages. So I started really deep diving into experts of the female metabolism to really learn how, how does it really work? And it, it's very intricate and it's, it's, it takes a lot more effort. And the craziest thing I learned about the female metabolism is it's much more susceptible to stress than the male metabolism, especially as a woman hits menopause, postmenopause. And, and so what we really want to focus on with women is this understanding of it takes a different strategy to drive high performance. It can't be this strategy to just work out really hard and, and cut back on what you eat. It's all these forms of stress that women are being given to try to drive performance. And it's actually making them feel worse, perform worse. And then at a certain point, I hear it all the time. It's like, I didn't change anything. And all of a sudden, I just put belly fat on out of nowhere. Like, what happened? I didn't change anything. It just came and now I can't get it off. And so exploring these strategies, it's been a really fun topic and a really fun topic to learn about because I don't have, I don't have any emotional connection to the female metabolism. So I can just look at it more logically. And so that's really helped me understand what women need to really optimize their performance, whether it's in business, sport, whatever it is they're doing, where they want to feel and look and perform their best. It's just a really cool combination of of different strategies and what we're used to hearing. 
Okay. So that is super cool. Now we want you to share those strategies. We want to know what we need to do to help us feel yeah. to help us with that metabolism BS that pisses me off so much and, um, you know, and just feeling better. Yeah. So, so one of the biggest, where I really start is the exercise realm. Cause there's so much misunderstanding around this. Weightlifting is the greatest gift to the female metabolism. But what women have been told is that, oh, that's bad. You need to do lots and lots of cardio. Well, lots and lots of cardio, especially too much like high intensity cardio. I, I, don't, I don't mind it. I know we just talked about this. I don't mind it. It's the abuse of it that, that worries me because too much, too much high intensity cardio drives the stress hormones too much. And then women can't recover as well from that. And then, for example, if you take away things like carbohydrates from a woman that's under a lot of stress, she now loses one of her greatest gifts she has to help bring the stress hormones down. And so there's an example of go do a lot of cardio and avoid carbs. Well, that is a recipe for disaster in my world of performance for women because it destroys the ability to recover and stress runs rampant. So I, what I like to really push on my female clients is lift weights and walk a ton. Because walking is the one thing we have that brings down the stress hormones and makes you more insulin sensitive. And then I like to help them use carbohydrates strategically. I'm not saying go eat carbohydrates all day long. We know that's bad. But for example, first meal after a hard workout is a great time to eat carbs because your muscle glycogen levels are low. Your stress is high. You eat the carbs. You'll recover quicker. I also like to use carbs at the end of the day to bring the stress hormones down to drive better sleep. It helps the brain get into a sleep state better. So there's a few examples of just some of the misnomers that we know of that women need to be hearing, especially as a, as a woman gets older and hits that menopause, post-menopause, that high intensity exercise becomes even more and more dangerous. So we have to be very strategic with it once or twice a week. The rest of the time we're lifting weights and walking. Uh, my recipe usually is lift weights, a little bit of cardio, walk, 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 de-stress, de-stress, de-stress. And that is the recipe for more success for the female metabolism typically. Okay. So you're going against everything that I do. And so <laughs> when you talk about carbs, okay, so we work out, right? So are yeah. you talking about like, after we go on a walk, we go on a three mile walk. No, is that more, more about more high intensity work? So more okay. after like weightlifting workout or uh, um, a high intensity cardio workout. Okay. Yeah. And Walking Jill put in calming. Okay. So that's the way we think of it. Okay. So, yeah. so we're just trying to alleviate the stress. The stress is what makes us gain yeah. weight unexpectedly. So yeah. Jill put in here, uh, there's a reason that keto doesn't work as well for women as opposed to men. Yes. So interesting. So, so she, she, she nails that from a hormonal standpoint. Um, yeah. So I was actually going to ask you a question, if you don't mind. Yeah. A lot of times people talk about their metabolism slowing down. Whereas like in this, in what I've read, it's not so much that your metabolism is slowing down. It's more because you're losing muscle, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's more of that as opposed to like, oh, I'm getting older. So my metabolism is slowing down where the real issue is that the decrease in muscle over time means that you're burning less calories. Yes. And that is, that is the issue. And I think that that's something I spend a lot of time for um, explaining to people that, and, you know, and I, Stacey, I see your question, like this stuff starts in like your late thirties, early forties. And I think what I, my experience with this, and I, maybe Allie can also chime in here as well, is um, people think of menopause as something that happens in their fifties. They don't even want to consider like, oh, I'm going through menopause symptoms. Like I was literally talking to my sister an hour ago about this. She's, she's 46. And I'm like, you're probably going through some menopause symptoms now. Yeah. Like, and so well, what, what do you find in your practice in terms of like the education around metabolism, slowing myth versus yeah. understanding? Yeah. So I, um, I, there's a gentleman named Dr. Jade Tita. He's a naturopathic doctor that I learned a lot about this from. And one of the things he teaches is one of the biggest misunderstandings is the actual metabolism. Everybody thinks it's calories in versus calories out. What he teaches, and I love it, is he teaches that the metabolism is simply a stress barometer. So what it's doing is it's basically reading all the stress you're under externally, internally, and then it's giving us men, men and women, it's giving us signs and symptoms as to how metabolism is doing. He calls it schmeck. Sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings are the call signs from how the metabolism is doing. If it's under too much stress, one to all of those are going to start to get off. 
You're going you're gonna to start having a hard time sleeping. You're going to start being more moody than normal. Your hunger is going to be elevated. Your energy is going to crash. You're going to have weird cravings. So we look at the metabolism more at, at that realm of how is it doing? Is it happy or is it not happy? If it's not happy, we got to go in and fix it. If it is happy, we keep doing what we're doing. That's how we kind of regulate and watch the metabolism. But yeah, the biggest mistake being made with the female metabolism is two things, not eating enough protein. And then we're talking from young ages, not eating enough protein and not lifting weights enough. So what's happening is they're not taking advantage of the muscle. Exactly. Like muscle is the most important thing to a healthy metabolism. Muscle mass is the number one predictor of, of longevity, according to Tufts University. Number two is strength. So muscle and strength, if you're looking to live, live a long, you know, good life, you got to maintain your muscle mass. And the way you do that is eat enough protein and lift weights. So what's happening with the female metabolism is we're told don't eat enough protein and do a lot of cardio, two things that create muscle catabolism or the loss of muscle mass. So we want to start changing the way women look at this and say, no, my muscle is the most important part of me. Now, it's very hard to put muscle mass on. I get paid a lot of money with professional male athletes to do that. And it is strategic and it is mind-numbingly boring and it's hard. Uh, you know, we're not using 10 pound dumbbells and they're growing. They're using, you know, three, 400 pounds and still having a hard time putting muscle on. So what we want to make sure is that there's resistance training going on. There's good protein intake coming in. And that will really help protect a lot of things with metabolism. For example, if you eat enough protein, you're going to have less blood sugar regularity issues. So that there's a really important component of that realm. So yes, you're exactly right. I believe muscle is probably one of the most important factors of the metabolism, of looking good, of feeling good, and of increasing your risk, your, your, your the potential of living a long, healthy, happy life. So interesting. Oh my gosh. I've been told I need to do weights forever. And Jill is guilty of totally pressuring me to do that. And I didn't realize the amount of what, you know, what I, I'm Jill, so I know, I know. I'm so guilty about this. I feel oh. so guilt. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Um, but yeah, some of these people are, but we have more posts in here. Um, Hannah, what if you never not had wonky schmeck? Is it because of her kids? I believe yes, of course, it's because of the kids. But, you know, some people have always had a hard time with their metabolism. I, yeah. I have too, Hannah. So, I mean, what do you have to say to that? Is it still kind of you just come back to these basics? Yeah. So if, if you've never had an issue with Schmeck, it means one of two things. One, uh, you're either using a lot of caffeine and stimulants during the day to keep your energy good. Uh, and I would challenge that. I said, get off all the caffeine and stimulants for three days. And day four, we'll really know for sure if your Schmeck is in a good place. Um, that's very common. People mistake false energy from caffeine as, oh, I feel really good because it, it can mask it a little bit. But if your Schmeck is in check and you don't have issues with it, don't change anything. Because in that scenario, if that is true, what we know is your blood chemistry should be good. Um, your, your, your body should look good. You should feel good. You should have great energy. You should sleep great. All those things should be in place if that's the case. Uh, so I, I, you know, I literally just walked off a stage presenting to a group before I jumped on this. And a lot of times what happens is, hey, um, can you do a call with my significant other? He or she is doing these crazy things and I need you to tell them to stop. And the last one that this guy's like, you got to talk to my wife. Like she is doing this crazy stuff. You need to make her stop. And so I jumped on a call with her and we went through kind of a Schmeck assessment and we get to the end of it. I'm like, don't change a thing. Like what you're doing is working for you. And the husband's like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm like, dude, I just told you about Schmeck. I just went over this in the presentation. Your wife nailed it. Like I wouldn't change a thing with her. Like it's, she's in a great spot. Like, why would I go ruin that? Uh, so it's, it's funny how that works. So, yeah. So what Hannah was saying is, Ali, I'm going to come right to you because I see, I know you have a lot to <laughs> contribute to this conversation. Oh, happy to contribute or listen to. Yeah. So no, she, she is a wealth of information. Um, but what Hannah's saying is that she has always felt out of, a, you know, oh, 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 always yeah. So the opposite. Yeah. yeah. And I have too. And so, regular, I've yeah. never had a regular, I've always struggled with pregnancy. well. That's not true. Ever since my second pregnancy, I've always had totally, I used to be super level-headed. Yeah. No. And I suspected something to do. I mean, I'm kind of gathering little bits of information everywhere I go, but I've yet to pin down exactly what it is. It's I I like your Schmeck outline that you've got. That's 
that's an interesting way to um, measure. Because I mean, you were talking about stress levels and stuff. Like, well, how do I know? I mean, that sounds like a silly question, and and but but I honestly don't usually know if I'm stressed until like multiple days into it. I start my shoulder will start to bind up, and then I'm like, oh shoot, I'm stressed out. I gotta like start to react. But yeah, but then I'm days into it, and I'm already paying the price. Yeah, I I've, I've, I have noticed that uh, this day and age, we are experts in ignoring the signs and symptoms of stress until they're so obvious. That it's like you can't ignore it. I just had a gentleman I was working with. He comes in to work out and like he's just twitching all over the place. Like he's doing an exercise, his legs. Are, he's like literally like dancing the whole time. I'm like, what is wrong with you? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you're dancing. Like you're literally lifting weights and you're dancing. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, look at your legs. And they, they couldn't keep them still. I'm like, you're going to the hospital right now. Like I've never seen this. Like I don't know what this is. And they run all these CAT scans, brain scans, everything. And it comes back that he was insanely stressed out. They literally gave him a shot of Xanax and everything just slipped the mellowed out. The doctor's like, you got to change your lifestyle. So that's why I like the Schmeck assessment. In my world, when I, when I had my facility, I had my medical team right in house. I was like, let's do blood chemistry every month. Like, let's watch everything. And well, people didn't like that idea. So that's when I met with Dr. Tita and he started teaching me more about these ideas of a Schmeck. So you can kind of use questionnaires to get an, an assessment on how people are doing. So if your Schmeck has been out of check for a long period of time, you've been under stress for a long period of time. You've just gotten used to it. Okay. And, and having children is a very stressful experience. It takes a long time for the body to recover from that. And then now you have children, they're not sleeping. And I don't know how old your kids are, but um, that's a hard period of time. So what I really like to recommend is I, I would, I would go see a naturopathic doctor, uh, get some blood chemistry done to get an idea of where in the metabolism there's issues because stress causes issues in the metabolism somewhere um, and use that expertise. But um, what I would suggest also is I would start walking a lot. Like walking is the greatest gift we have to calm the metabolism down, especially outside if you can. Um, and I, I know sometimes weather can play into that, but walking outside is the easiest way to bring stress down, to improve insulin sensitivity and to really start getting you into a better place. Okay, so you, okay, so just, Wendy just hopped on. So just to reiterate, because I'm trying to absorb this because this goes against a lot of what I do. Um, so you're saying only do the, the hard workouts twice, you know, like the, the hard cardio workouts, maybe a hit workout or whatever, twice a week. Yeah. Add in a crap ton of walking as much as you can. Yeah. And after you do these really hard workouts, do, add in some carbs. Yeah. I'm sure it's just the healthy type of carbs, not the potato chips that are sitting in my <laughs> yeah, cupboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be specific with that, but that's yeah. really what kind of what you're saying. And then add a lot of protein to our diets. Yeah. You want to have protein yeah, three meals a day. Um, the protein is the kind of the core scenario and then use carbs accordingly and then use your fats and vegetables with your meals as well. But, um, you know, just strategically use the carbs to help control the stress. So I typically, I typically don't like people to have carbs first thing in the morning because of what carbs do to the brain. Carbs calm the brain down, make it kind of relaxed, it helps with recovery, helps you fall asleep. We don't want that first thing in the morning typically. Now, if you're someone who has a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiousness, that's when I would use carbs every meal of the day, a little bit every meal of the day to help buffer that stress response and calm the brain down. That's about, I'm like around 10 to 15% of people I deal with, I do that. So the majority of people, I'd have no carbs at breakfast, just proteins, good fats, lunch, protein, good fats, vegetables, and then typically dinner is the protein, carbs, and vegetables, okay? That's mm -hmm. typically how I like to do that. Do you, do you mind if I add in for the cardio piece, just so women can understand the women talk on this one? Is, yeah. um, so for me, guys, if I, I have a majority of patients that I won't have do cardio at all. The cardio factor I will have is more of a interval training with weights. So like he said, 100% of the time building muscle mass on your body is going to regulate hormones, increase strength, reduce fat, burn more calories even when we're sleeping. But just so you guys understand calories, calories were made popular by a doctor back in the fifties who, who, you know, struggled with weight her whole life. She ended up dying of, of obesity and it turned to kind of into shame and guilt, like that big, big potato is X amount of calories instead of a baked potato. So fueling your body is one thing, but 
everybody on this call is a metabolic process. And this is why calories don't really make a lot of sense if you really look into it. Everybody on this call is metabolic process is different right now. So that treadmill that tells you you've burned that many calories is inaccurate, right? The food bringing in, but tomorrow we'll wake up and all of our metabolic process will be even different from today. So for women as a whole, over 40, because pretty much we're talking to this group and Midori, you asked like, you're, if you're going for cardio high intensity, you're basically, if you don't have the bandwidth to give it right. And Hannah, whoever said once, once they had kids, it changed, you turn up on and off genes, like a sheet of music with everything you do, with what you hear from us today, with how you react to it, with what you eat, the air you breathe. So when you're turning it on and off those genes, a big, you know, swack to the immune system, having child, someone passing away, getting really sick can truly change how your genetics present. So you can be completely different. So I fully agree on the getting you know, metabolically tested, hormone tested, functionally tested. Um, but from a cardio standpoint, if your bandwidth is low because you're already the owner of a company and you already have a high stress life and your already output is so high that you're not within your constraints, cardio is going to tax your adrenal when your adrenal is already exhausted, which I would guess CEO women, 80% are, then it's going to tax your thyroid. And once we do those two, we are irre irreplaceable when it comes to energy, you're never going to get back to that former function again. So if you're really trying to change your body composition, it's very much protein first meal of the day and throughout the day and heavy weights, heavy for you weights, um, when it comes to metabolism and when it comes to weight loss. So for those of you that felt like you were born with the, um, you know, short end of the stick on metabolism, those two really are heads and tails and they've done so many studies when it's cardio versus strength training and strength training all day every day when scientifically and physiologically for women 100 i agree 100 wow so, um brad um one, a question i have is is that so i live in seattle and so there's um a part of the time of the year and i think hannah has a similar thing um i think she said she was in montana um, where getting out for a walk is not, um, you know, say weather conducive. Right. Yeah. And like, so I have, I have a rower at home, I have a skier at home, I have a Peloton bike at home and I have an assault bike. I have everything here. Like yeah. in addition to all the weights. Um, so what would you recommend for the equivalent of walking if you can't get outside yeah, it's any type of activity that keeps your heart rate under 110. So it's steady, it's steady movement, but your heart rate stays under 110. That is a de-stressing activity. Right. And I'm, I'm generalizing I it. My heart rate and I track that and everything. Yeah, I'm, it's I'm, like I'm, zone I'm, two type of thing, zone one. Yeah, you yeah, you want to stay zone one, lower end of zone two. And I, I guess I'm generalizing because yeah. everyone's level of conditioning yeah. is different. Right. So uh, to replicate that. So I, I grew up just outside of Portland, Oregon, where mm -hmm. it majority of the year it rained. Uh, so I understand, I understand what you're, what you're talking about. So right. yeah, just in that like zone one to low into zone two, I yeah. generally say try to to keep your heart under 110. That is a de-stressing activity. Okay. I mean, yeah, I know my zone. So I had my yeah. zone tested. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's Brad, can you talk a little bit about adrenals? Because that was when I went through, or again, I've gone through your 21 day cleanse a number of times, but you and I have talked about that too, about yeah. the importance of cleaning out our adrenals. We talk about metabolism. We know that we shouldn't be drinking a ton of alcohol, all this other stuff, but let's talk about the adrenals because that really made a profound difference in, in the way that my body felt. Yeah, like as was brought up earlier. I'm sorry, I don't know the the lady that was talking earlier. I can't remember her name, but um, Ellie. Yeah, Jill. She about, uh, yeah, she was talking about the adre like the, the adrenals and robbing the thyroid. We live in such a high stress state day in and day out, and what people aren't realizing, and she brought this up, is that you have to look at what's the rest of my life look like. To make stress, it's going to be one of two things. Exercise is going to either be a you stress or a distress. It's it's always a form of stress. If your life is overwhelming, you have a lot of hardship going on, or you know you're, you're going through some pain, or uh, you're not sleeping well, you have little children. Like you have to consider overall stress load in a day to say is exercise going to be 
good for me, a use stress, I'll be able to recover from it and benefit from it, or is it going to be a distress to me? It's going to cause problems. Most people are in an overly stressed state this day and age. We're overly stimulated. I mean, my God, I read a study recently that showed on a typical day today is the equivalent of in the mid-1980s, the amount of information you're processing is equivalent to reading 75 newspapers back in the mid-80s. Like it's over <laughs> just that scenario alone. So all these factors aren't being considered that are happening to us. And so what I have seen was people are just overwhelmed with stress, trying to exercise and to get everything done. And we're told do more and commit more. Like, you got to post all this stuff on social media. You got all, all these things. And it gets to the point where metabolism is just saying, screw it. I, I can't deal with it. It's just starts shutting down to protect itself. So I like to give just people at least once or twice a year, just a three week break from it all. So like stop working out so much, replace that with taking naps, going for a walk, get a massage, give your body a chance to use that extra energy to go in and help heal up any problems that are there. You know, maybe your liver is a little overly congested and that's overwhelming the body. Well, take a break from all the lactic acid production that's overwhelming the liver, sleep more, recover more, move more, let the lymphatic system work. It's, it's magic. Just give yourself a break periodically from all the intensity. And that just helps helps the adrenals rebound a bit. I, I really think that that stress is the most important thing to factor in. I really think like we should keep our workouts under four, like forty five minutes or less when we do work out hard, especially with weights. Like it's, I th that is my favorite thing. Like you can train with weights and condition your heart. Like it, that was brought up. Like that is incredible. Just look up German body comp training. You'll see what I'm talking about. You're lifting weights, but you're training the cardiovascular system and you're getting drastic improvement across the body, but generating less stress on the body. And I think people should implement forms of stress reduction every single day, whether it's a 15 minute meditation, a 15 minute nap, just step outside, go for a walk. The more we can implement strategies to bring the overall stress load down, the more beneficial exercise is going to be because the adrenals can handle it. If your adrenals cannot handle the demand you're putting on it, you're just digging yourself into a grave. Into a grave. Okay, so okay. are you hearing echo or is it just me? I, I heard an e echo of myself there for a second. Okay, is, is it better now? Everyone else who's here? Okay, good. Um, and so there's some other things that you've talked about that you taught, you know, that, that yeah, that you talk about that help with adrenals. So yes, it's all about the stress, which I didn't realize the impact of stress on our overall. I mean, I know it's, it's bad, but I didn't realize how it affects us so um, in, in every part of our life. So you talk about lemon water, you talk about some different things to help us clean our adrenals, but also to help us sleep better. Because I, I have been learned, learning a lot about the type of sleep we get. So don't, not just going to bed earlier and trying to sleep longer, it's yeah. the level of sleep that we have. And so I think the adrenals probably come into that a bit too, right? Yeah. So I just to clarify, I use like the lemon water in the morning, the, the cranberry water, like to help it helps support more detoxification, different path and that kind of non-supplemental natural ways to help support detoxification. Cause I, I also think there should be daily support of detoxification because we live in the most toxic environment we've ever lived in. So that's for that. And that helps take load off the, off the adrenals. Uh, sleep is super critical, but a lot of people have a hard time falling asleep, staying asleep. And the, the falling asleep component can really be a sign that you're stressed out trying to sleep at night, waking up in the middle of the night. That can be a sign, a stress related sign as well. Let's say your blood sugar crashes in the middle of the night, the body's going to hit an endorphin rush to get in, uh, the adrenals up to get the blood sugar stable so you don't die. And that'll wake you up in the middle of the night. So there's strategies you like to do. I do a couple things with my, my high-performing entrepreneurs. First off, I want to calm the brain down. So I'll have them set a stopwatch for 60 seconds, hit go, write down the three most important things that have to get done the next day. That calms the brain from spinning out, trying to, trying to remember, I was trying not to forget. We waste a lot of energy on that because we're so overwhelmed with information. Two, I'll also have them write down three to five things they're grateful for. We want to shift subconscious. We're genetically wired to find bad. And, and, and in the wild, that kept us alive. But now we're, you know, we're in bed. The doors are locked. No one's trying to get us. But we're making things up. Like, what if we lose this contract? Or what if this employee leaves us? There's all these things that are constantly getting us going. So just writing down three to five things you're grateful for will shift that. So that'll help calm your brain down and drive sleep. And then I like to do things like a really easy supplement is something like magnesium. My, my favorite form is magnesium bisglycinate. Just taking some of that before bed can help calm the body down. Um, and that, that can drive better sleep as well. And the, the better you, the better your sleep is, the better you recover, 
the less stress hormones you'll wake up with the next morning. Now they show if you don't sleep enough, the amount of stress hormones in the bloodstream when you wake up is much higher than if you do sleep enough. So we want to try to drive better sleep to create the recovery, to keep the stress hormones in a better place. So when we wake up in the morning, we're starting off at a better place versus starting at a heightened state. Okay, great. So Stacy has a question about, and we have a number of parents here. Um, Stacy, you want to come off mute and chat with Brad? So she had a question about kids. Go ahead, Stacy. Um, so my dilemma now is we, I have two boys and they are moving into 11 and 13 age and it's becoming more and more about going all year in one sport yeah. in order to be competitive. And not only does it bring my adrenal glands up, but I can't imagine what it's doing with my kids. So how do I model this lifestyle when our society is saying, well, in order for your kids to succeed or be competitive, which I hear a ton, yeah. and it's a pressure that a lot of the parents are feeling they are either missing out or are being they have to do. Yeah. Um, how do you address this? Or because since you work with athletes as well as yeah. people who are competitive in in their work field. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what what sports do your boys play? Baseball. Baseball. Okay. Um, here's the funny thing about baseball. So I work with a lot of major league baseball players. Did you know that they take four months of the year completely off of baseball? Like they finish the season. They come out for the first four months, they work out, they don't pick up a baseball, they don't swing a bat, they don't throw a ball. And then about a month before spring training starts, they'll pick it all back up and then they'll, they'll, they'll rebound into it. Um, one of the greatest disservices we're doing to young athletes is in America is we are ruining them because of exactly what you're talking about. We're demanding they play year round. Uh, I have a daughter that plays volleyball and it's the same world that like you got school volleyball then you have club volleyball. And if you don't participate, you're going to fall behind. Unfortunately, that ruins more good athletes in America than it creates. Um, there's a lot of demand around. It's really not what's best for the kids. It's what's best for the club's financial scenario. Um, and what happens when these kids finally get to college, like the, the dream is to get to college. These kids get to college. They get out of the system. And most of them are done after the first year. Like they've lost the passion, the love for it. So in reality, your child will not fall behind if they take breaks from the sport. They'll actually be fresher. They'll have more love for the game. They'll progress better, longer if they take breaks away from the game. That, that, that is, I'm just presenting you the truth of working with athletes. Uh, our young athletes are competing and in, in sports, specifically training, way more than professional athletes are this day and age. Uh, and it's really sad. And if you look at, for example, I think it's the Netherlands or Denmark or something like that. They have taken over as the country that's won the most Olympic winter medals of any country throughout history. And years ago, they wanted to really revamp their youth sports programs. So they sent a few experts to America to see how we did it. So they watched how we developed our young athletes. They came back and here was their advice. You should do everything the exact opposite that America does. Under the age of 12, there should be no sports specific training. There should be no rankings. There should be no score kept. The children should just be able to participate in all the sports, learn the sports, have fun with the sports, fall in love with the sports. And then at age 12, they can begin to self-select and then begin to start doing individualized training or sports specific training to develop in those sports. And by doing that process, they now dominate the world of sports that they participate in, which is the Winter Olympic sports. We're in America. I, I, so I was on the U.S. bobsled team. If you go to an Olympic training center in the summertime away from sport, you will see young athletes doing the ski jumps like they're, they're training like crazy at young ages in the middle of summer at, at very young ages. They're very specific already at very young ages. But we get dominated by the Netherlands and Denmark because of how they've done it. So the, 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 the truest advice I can give you is to find some time to give your kids breaks. They will not fall behind. That is a lie. But if you just can't, you have to get very strategic on how you help the kids recover from the volume of sport they're under. Um, meaning that you have to help them get away, like make sure they got episodes of just having fun doing other things. Okay. Um, so try to work that in, uh, make sure that they're eating well, make sure they're staying plenty hydrated and make sure they're sleeping well. Okay. 
doing a different sport is a break. When I grew up, we played football during football season. We played basketball during basketball season. We played baseball during baseball season. And then summer, we were kids. And we all ended up fine. I, I, a number of friends, myself included, ended up in professional sports. It, it, and a lot, of, a lot of college coaches, they're looking for the kids who grew up playing multiple sports because they have a better developed athlete on their hands. They can then fine tune into their sport. What they found if an athlete starts too young playing the same sport all the time, their athletic makeup is not as great. And the risk of injury is much higher because of what's called pattern overload. So I would suggest get them to play different sports, get them to you know do activities that are fun, that are active, just things away from the sport that there's their, their, their happy place. Otherwise, that happy place is going to become a source of pain for them. I don't know if that answer helped much or just gave you more stress, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry That's, for that. I'm just I'm just it's I'm, true, I'm, though. Yeah, I'm being I'm just being real and honest with you. And I'm going through the same struggle with my daughter. But like, for example, they tell you your kid's going to fall behind. My daughter is a sophomore in high school. She picked up a volleyball for the first time a year and a half ago and never played it before. Had no idea what she was doing. I still have the video of her first game. It's hilarious. Fell in love with the sport, like passionately love with the sport and started working on the sport. A year later, as a freshman, makes the varsity team. She's now a year and a half in as a, she just turned 15 and she just made a 17 U ones volleyball team and in club, but the passion is there. The drives there. She caught up quick. I have a professional golfer that didn't pick up a golf club till he was 13 years old and was told you started too late. You'll never be great. He's one of the best golfers in the world now. So these lies that we're being fueled to drive financial benefit to clubs is a lie. Your children will not fall behind by taking breaks from those sports. Your children are not behind if they started the sport late. As a matter of fact, they're going to fall passionately in love with it. They're going to have the drive. They're just going to outwork everyone because they passionately love it versus being forced to do it since they were six, seven, eight years old. The same thing happened with my nephew. He picked up tennis during COVID and then he made the varsity tennis team as a freshman. Yeah. Right? And he's a sophomore now. Yeah. And um, we come from a soccer family. And so my sister, you know, was like, oh my God, now I'm like, he likes tennis more than soccer. And I think yeah. you're going to have to like deal with that. And she's yeah. like, I know, but it's just one of those things where he loves playing tennis. And he started when he was 13, never picked up a racket before then. And, but I'm seeing like, I'm starting to see more of this like rebound of certain parents, like pushing back on more of like quality family time and just like taking a break. There yeah. was a really great blog at one point um, by this woman named Alex Flanagan, who used to be like a sideline broadcaster for NBC. Um, she doesn't do it anymore, but it was a really great blog that talked about, I love to watch you play as com, And it was just around like the focus of, let's not talk about the fact that we're counting on you to get a scholarship or be go professional or whatever. It was just like, look, I love watching you play and having fun with your teammates and that mindset. And I think that's another thing that could possibly up. Cause I'm very careful with the language I use with our nieces and nephews when we see them play or we get a video or something to not be like, Oh my God, you know, like great goal. Because then if they don't score, I don't want them to feel like I don't value the benefits of activity. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, with kids, it's, it's, um, it's a whole nother stressor for us as parents. Right. And, you know, the co I think there's a coach ego that comes into this too, that yeah. drives people wanting to play all the time, but I wanted to get back for a minute to the weights and, you know, us as women, right. Because so many of us, especially if you were raised at the, in the um, era that I was raised, it was all about cardio. Yeah. And so with weights, Okay. So with weights, how much weight weights should we be doing? How should we be doing it? Because, and here's the other question I have for you, Brad is first, like, I love my Peloton treadmill. I, I seriously, I love it. I would marry it if I could, because I love it so much, but, and then, and I can get on it any time, right? Yeah. It's, I, I can look like crap. I don't need to wear a cute outfit that matches. I don't care, yeah. but to go to the gym, it's a whole nother stressor for many of us, right? right? So what can we do at home? How, what kind of weights should we have? What are things that we can do that are really easy that, that any of us can implement regardless of what the weather's like and um, yeah. that we can do easily? 
I, I, all you need is is a couple pairs of dumbbells, you know, like maybe I said it like 10, 15, 20, 25, like you don't have to have much and just twice a week for like 30 to 45 minutes and, and training your, your whole body. You know, you just do some leg exercises, some push exercises, some pull exercises to, to you just, just want to put external resistance on the muscle to challenge it. it, it I mean, it. Yeah, adjustable dumbbells are great. Like the the ones that have the pins, you can change the weights. Those are awesome. Those are what we have at my house. Um, and, and you know, during COVID, I got you know, I I got stuck out of a gym for a year, and so we just had the adjustable dumbbells, and we just made do with it. You can do push ups, you can do sit ups. Like you just want to add external resistance to the muscle tissue to challenge it. That's what we're trying to do to maintain that strength and that muscle mass. You have to challenge the muscle to maintain it. Okay, I mean, so should we strategic on on lifting weights? Like there's great strategy you can put behind it but what we really need is just a starting point of challenge the muscle and all you need is some dumbbells for that and you can you can jump on youtube anything and just get some weight workouts and follow just get just google full body weight workout and a bunch of options will come out okay so then you talked about we can do we can work our cardio through weights does that mean we should be doing them really fast like having a, a circuit that we do or are you the, just saying if we lift weights, it's working our hearts to the point yeah. that that we need to have them at? The, the one rule I like to follow is lower the weight slowly, lift the weight quickly. So like if I'm doing a, a chest press and I'm, I'm dumbbells, and I'm just, like for example, three, two, one, fast up, three, two, one, fast up, you know, and anywhere from eight to 15 reps and change it up. I like to go, I like to superset a lower body exercise with an upper body exercise. And then do like anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds of rest between them. Do like three sets of, of a lower body exercise and upper body exercise. Then switch it up a different lower body exercise and a different upper body exercise. Eight to eight to 15 reps, that three seconds down, fast up, three sets of that one. And then just go three groups of two exercises, three sets of each one with 30 to 45 seconds rest. And boom, you're good. You, you, you're getting a good workout in, a good okay. resistance workout. This has been what, awesome. And what, what happens when you, when you do that, what your heart rate's going to get up and you're going to be changing levels. You're going to be, you're going to be pushing the blood all around your body. So you're challenging the heart as well. You're getting some cardiovascular benefit from it as well. This is typically how I train my female clients is they'll go lower body to upper body and we'll have shorter rest periods, those controlled tempos. And then all of a sudden your body's conditioned. I promise you can go out and do anything. You can go out and survive any type of cardio workout when you train that way. But if you do a lot of cardio and you get challenged with the resistance workout, you're not going to make it. That's why I like this method so much better than these other methods. I, my dad is 90 years old and he always worked out. Like he was a huge runner. He rides the, he used to ride the bike all the time and then COVID hit and he stopped doing everything, but he never did weights. Mm -hmm. And now at 90 years old, he's super healthy, but his body's giving out yeah. because he's not strong enough. He's, he's yeah. not stable. And so, you know, you talked about longevity. I think he'd live to 120 if he added in the weights, but yeah. he's very stubborn and won't. But I think, you know, in alignment with what you've been talking about, that's kind of the, if we future pace ourselves, that has been what I've seen. Yeah. I, my, so my father died of a genetic disease. It was a muscle wasting disease. It's crazy to watch what happens as you lose muscle mass. If you, if you, if, if, like I'm so obsessed with maintaining muscle mass because I watched what happened and he couldn't stop it. It was just genetically, it's what it's, it's called myotonic dystrophy. It's just, a, it's a muscle wasting disease slowly over time. And the last five years of his life to see what someone, how someone functions with no muscle mass is it's horrific to witness. Yeah. It's awful. Gosh, this has been so helpful. Any last questions? Ali, go for it. You're, you're on mute. Ali, Ali, you're on mute. Just one last thing to add that, and Brad, I'm so sorry about your father. That's, um, that is a tough one to watch. The um, number one cause, and you can ask every doctor in this, but in functional medicine, what they studied about a year ago, the number one cause of death at age 70. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Because we always think cardiovascular disease, et cetera, of Jill. It's falling, right? It's taking a fall. It's not falling, falling is the outcome, but it's sarcopenia, which is loss of muscle mass. Right. The number one cause 70, which I feel like we're not far from sadly, is loss of muscle mass. So if it's not gonna get you to strength train so that you can look better and fit in a better pant size and have more energy and all 
that just from a longevity standpoint, it is, it's your number one from fountain of youth. Interesting. I did not know that, but since you just brought this up, Allie, can we talk about functional medicine? Mm -hmm. I keep on hearing about it. I'd love to know more, Brad. I know you have um, something to contribute to that too. Let's, let's talk about that. What is functional medicine? So functional medicine is basically the totality of the human, right? So normally you have a brain tumor, you go to a neurologist, you have something going on with your kidney, you go to a nephrologist and we take everything in silos and that doctor treats that one thing. But if you just look at it from a holistic standpoint of the body, not holistic as in, you know, which is brew, but holistic, meaning the totality of the human is that everything is related. It's very very difficult to have any illness or imbalance in your body if you don't have a toxicity or a deficiency. So if you have, for instance, high cholesterol, you will go to the doctor today. They will put you on a statin, the number one drug that made the most money in the entire world. Do you know there's not one direct causal study? I was part of all of these studies that shows that you should take a statin if you have high cholesterol unless you've already previously had a heart attack, then we've got the data for it. But the majority of people haven't, there's no causal study. So it's a very inflammatory marker that causes myalgia and myopathy and all these other things. So instead of saying you have high cholesterol, here's a pill, why do you have high cholesterol? So functional medicine gets to the why. And instead of putting out the smoke, it's putting out the fire of it. So what in your body is imbalanced that could be causing that, right? Do we have a really high inflammatory response? Do we not enough have enough even um, magnesium like Brad was talking about? So your muscles, right? If you, if you think about your veins and your arteries, I mean, your veins and your yeah arteries, the only difference is your artery has muscle. So even from a super easy standpoint, if you guys answer these questions, any high blood pressure in the family, any muscle twitches in your, in your body ever, do you not sleep well? Do you not have a daily bowel movement or do you have any heart health, big events in your family? Am I heart attack, stroke? If any of those or most of those resonate, you're deficient in magnesium. There's different magnesiums for different things, but back to the high cholesterol, your arteries have muscle in it, your veins don't. So if your arteries contract and they don't relax, that equates high blood pressure, right? That also can equate to high cholesterol because if it does deficient in magnesium, magnesium is a smooth tissue relaxer. So there's, we look at all the minerals, all the vitamins, we look at your hormones, basically your metabolic function. So Hannah, when you were talking and Brad, you said, get some functional testing. One of my very favorite tests to give any patient, if I can't figure them out like that, and I probably would give a test to 30% of my patients, 70%, I'm like, we can get this through lifestyle and nutrition pretty easy, is called an organic acids test. Um, it tests 80 metabolic functions in your body, anything from candida, right, which is, you know, high yeast, which kind of you shovel against the tide, trying to fix anything else. Like I can see that 20 of your markers are off, but if you have high yeast, that's why your markers are off. If I treated these 20 markers, what a waste of time and money when it is, this was the causal. If I run a, a functional hormone test on a woman and their estrogen is low or their E2 or their testosterone, I won't touch it if their DHEA is off because that's the umbrella hormone, right? So everything causes something else in the body and functional medicine looks at the causal versus what came out of it. Like, how did we get there versus, oh, we're here, where in the world are we? Um, so it's a really different thing. There's very few doctors, the only people, sadly, like myself, that do functional medicine very likely had a very bad health event and medicine failed them. And so they had to get annoyed enough or, or you know, inquisitive enough enough to learn. Um, you know, I was going to be a doctor my whole life. And then I had an event and went back for a master's and a PhD in, in functional nutrition and medicine. And it was a game changer. And I felt bad because I worked with physicians my whole life. I taught surgery for 16 years and I, I, I feel bad for everybody in medicine. Like we do great at the acute things like surgery, but we don't do well at chronic or preventative. So of the trillions of dollars we spend in healthcare, we spend one half of 1% to prevent disease. And it's much easier to prevent than to shovel against the tide once you have it. Make so, sense? Yeah, this is so interesting. So to get an organic acids test or the functional testing, because I think there's two, those are two different things, I believe. 
So yep, organic acids is just one of the tools in the arsenal, depending, like I will usually talk to someone for a little bit before I decide, they'll say, I need a hormone test. And then I'll talk to them. I'm like, nope, you need this instead, right? Or it sounds like this is off instead and therefore throwing your hormones out of whack. Um, but yeah, you can get them through any functional practitioner. I can order it for you. Um, I can ship everywhere except for New York because of New York's laws. So sorry, anybody <laughs> in New York, um, but you can always have a friendship it but um so yep they're they're an easy um you know urine test and organic acids is a urine test you do it first thing in the morning you can't have certain foods before one being grapes so the wine's out for about 48 hours um and apples but it's a it's one of those game-changing tests i would say if i were president never would i want that job if we could give everybody an oats test at 25 years old we've had we would have very little disease in this world in this country so I didn't realize what functional medicine was. And so this is so, so interesting. Brad, is this stuff that you incorporate too into, into what you do? Because I know you're kind of the holistic, you're a holistic type of health person as well. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, uh, I have a functional medicine doctor. My kids see a functional medicine doctor multiple times a year. I, I really try to push all my clients to get in and see a functional medicine doctor because they're, they're going to get in and break it down and find this, like she talked about, the cause of the problems. So I, I like to I like to stay on top of that, using my team in that realm to keep everyone in a really good spot. So that then the stuff I apply works really well. I'm not fighting anything, or there's yeah. nothing. That, there's nothing that I can. Nothing that there's a lot of if there if there's a if there's a if there's damage somewhere in the metabolism, I'm not gonna be able to fix it. I can't fix it. if something's broken or like she's talking about if the the, the organic acid says like I, my eight year old just took one uh, six months ago. It revealed a lot of stuff at eight years old that we're working on with him. But I believe that at the core of true health and performance, you, that has to be dialed in. Uh, so example, to example, my son, he wasn't doing well. Something was not right. I could just tell, took him to his pediatrician. He's like, he's fine. I'm like, I know my son, he's not fine. Like, can you just run some labs on him? I'm the doctor. I get to make that call. We don't need to do that. So I said, okay, fine. So I took him to the naturopathic doctor. I said, I need to run every lab under the sun. Something's not right with my son. And I was right. She found a plethora of issues that were causing all kinds of problems that she then fixed, was able to go in and solve the problem. And all of a sudden he's doing wonderful. All these issues that were coming up, they're saying are just normal, stop showing up. Um, so that's, I'm a big believer. And, and like that's where I spend my money on functional medicine. And only, why, only reason I'm going to the medical side is if it's an acute scenario and it has to be dealt with like quickly and now. If someone's, I mean, yeah, I'll take my son if he's got, you know, bronchitis or, you know, he, something's not right from a sickness standpoint, the antibiotics can help. We'll go to the pediatrician first. If I don't like what I hear from the pediatrician, I'm going to the naturopathic doctor, but he goes in every six months for my naturopathic doctor, functional medicine doctor to make sure that he's in a good place, staying in a good place. Like he has this, he has like a specialty blend of supplements that he takes that was made specifically for his needs from that organic acids test, just to keep everything in balance. Um, it's, it, I'm, I'm a huge, huge, I've always built my programs using a functional medicine doctor as my backbone for safety and help. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that makes a massive difference. I, I used to have, um, eczema when I was pregnant, yeah. I had eczema all over and I went to my, um, my skin doctor and he gave me all kinds of medication and it would help for just that spot, but it would still be there. Right. And it wouldn't go away. It would come back. And finally, I went to, we have a store here called Oliver's and um, they have a whole health section. And I told them what was going on. And they said, well, you need to take um, probiotics. And this, I had never even heard of that before, right? Probiotics. And then they gave me one other um, supplement and I took it and it went away and I've never had it again. And that's been 27 years, 28 years. So I hear what you're saying. We have to get to the root of what's really causing it. And then, so, and then also I cut out all the crappy white carbs that I, you know, the breads and all of that and the pastas because back then you ate pastas with no fat because it was supposed to help you lose weight because there's no fat and the opposite was happening. So yeah, I love this. What were you going to say, Ellie? Oh, I was just going to say to Brad, like how lucky that you have that knowledge because, and this is every patient I see, right? They're like, I went to the doctor. They say, nothing's wrong. I feel like crap. What do we do from here? Right. You have to hit that kind of wall, but you know, your child with those imbalances, although small now would be massive later. And so 
I like, these are the things that thrill me. I'm like, oh my God, you literally are saving lives. So how lucky that he has you for a dad because it changes everything and longevity. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I and mean, we can go on and on about this conversation because there's so much to it. Like you said, there's a lot of things that we can do now that prevent us from getting these horrible diseases and complications later on. So I'm hearing a 2.0 conversation on this. Um, so, but in the meantime, Brad, tell us where we can find out more information on you. Yeah. So, uh, I'm on Instagram a lot. My, uh, it's game.time.ready. Uh, I like, I like to work in a fashion. I, I, I tell people you gotta be ready for anything. And so the work I do with people is all about having people game time ready. Like, how do I have an athlete ready for a game? It's the same thing for life, the same thing for board meetings, the same thing for tough conversations with family. You got to have your body in a place to be ready. So game time ready is my Instagram and my website's braddavidson.com. Game Game.time.ready? Yep. That's my Instagram. Yeah. Okay. And my website is uh, braddavidson.com. And in case you happen to be in Temecula looking for a yeah. new resort to hang out at, what do you have going on there, Brad? Yeah, so uh, um, I teamed up with a group that just bought the Marietta Hot Springs Resort. It's this oasis of hot springs, uh, mud bass, and we've built the, we're building this whole program. It's actually where I'm at right now. We're building this whole program around revitalization, sleep, nutrition. There's actually a functional medicine doctor at the realm of it. Um, so we have all that in place. So we teach you how to revitalize yourself, how to sleep better. We teach you how to eat better. And then I am responsible for the fitness component of it. So we're opening up an, an epic gym here that's going to be actually classes based on weightlifting. So we're, we're combining that world of class, the, the hype, the fun, the energy, all that good stuff with weightlifting. It'll be the first one of its kind. I'm super excited to launch it. Okay, so... I'm hearing that we should do a retreat there that you can help um, us line up. 100% you should. That would be incredible. It's beautiful out here. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm I'm all in. Y'all in, ladies? T Southern California and... Epic wine, the epic wine countries all around us as well. <laughs> I was just going to say, <laughs> we have to now, add but... in wine. I, I, you know, that's yeah. just a prerequisite for anything I that I do. But yeah, I love it. Okay, well, thank you so much, Brad, and hey, all the other time. contributors in this in this area. If you guys are interested in some of these deeper things that we talked about, we have Brad, we have Allie, who's amazing, as you can hear, and we have Jill. These women know their stuff, and of course, Brad knows his stuff, but reach out because we can feel great without having to do some of these things that we do to ourselves. Clearly, I don't need to be doing as many freaking hit runs. I'm a little pissed off about that because I've spent a <laughs> lot of time on that. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone who contributed, Brad, thank you for being here and taking time out of your busy schedule. And we look forward to seeing you in Temecula and having you lead us in yes. some cool stuff. That will be epic. Yeah. Great yeah. seeing you ladies. Thank Continue you for being thank here. Everyone take care. Have a great week. You too. Bye. Thanks. Brad.